For those of you who don't know me, Ian Poe is my name. I'm a district vet with the local land services um, based in Kempsey. So I sort of cover the, the Warhope area as well. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. So there's a couple of other speakers tonight. Um, you'll get to hear from me. Uh, also Christy Saul, who's from New South Wales DPI and Mick Elliott, who's uh, one of our biosecurity officers involved in the invasive pests team. Uh, we've also got Lou up the back handing stuff out. Yeah, there's plenty of handouts up there. Feel free to grab um, whatever you like. Um, it saves us cutting home again. Um, we've also yeah, got um, some uh, of the team from New South Wales Health, Disaster Recovery, and Colleen will say a few words just at the end. Uh, in regards to questions, if we can just hold the questions just till the end of the uh, presentations, yeah, there'll be time for questions at the end. There, there may be some that we, we can't answer, um, particularly around things like border control and, and those sort of federal government type questions. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll do our best and um, yeah, if need be, we can get back to you. Uh, I'd also like to welcome David Dawson. So David's uh, our uh, local um, board member on the North Coast LLS board, and he'll just say a couple of words. Thanks, Poey. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's really good to see a good turnout. We've had some really good meetings so far. Dorigo, Bellingen, one in Kempsey the other night, and the local land services staff are putting them on right across the region, casino, Kyogre, Graft, and the whole works, and they're all being really well attended, and that's great, as it is a very important topic. Um, Ian and Christy will take you through um, what we can do at the farm level to make sure these diseases uh, don't get to our farms, but also minimise the spread if they ever do get into the country, which is what we can do. Um, I think we have to have a, bit of, a fair bit of faith in the customs and the quarantine guys doing their work at the airports and at the shipping terminals, and by all accounts, that's going quite well. Um, but uh, thank you very much for coming, and if you have any questions about LLS, the organisation, how we work and what we do, please come and see me after the session. More than happy to answer any of those sort of questions. But uh, thanks again, and back to it. Uh, thanks, David. Um, yeah, so we'll just uh, get into it. Um, so I guess the first thing is why the excitement about, uh, I mean, I suppose foot and mouth disease particularly has been in the media, but at the moment there are actually three uh, what they call EADs or emergency animal diseases that are uh, close to Australia, so in, to, to the north of the country, those being foot and mouth disease or FMD, lumpy skin disease or LSD and African swine fever or ASF. They will be talking tonight about uh, foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. We won't talk about African swine fever. Uh, it's a, a disease specific to pigs. If you have got pigs and you want to know more about ASF, then yeah, feel free to come and see me uh, after tonight or feel free to give me a call um, at, at any time and happy to talk to you about that disease. So all three of those diseases are currently present in one or multiple countries to our immediate north. Um, and, but, but none of them have been in Australia. So the foot and mouth uh, was last in Australia in 1872, a very small outbreak associated with the importation of stock um, back at that time uh, and was eradicated and we've never had an outbreak of either lumpy skin disease or ASF. With uh, foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, the mortality rates are, are quite high. Uh, quite low, sorry, uh, very low. So they don't kill a lot of animals, but obviously they make the animals unwell. And so there's health and welfare implications if they were to get into the country. So the foot and mouth disease, they obviously get very sore feet. We'll talk about the signs later. But there's certainly health and welfare implications. The, the big issue um, with particularly FMD is it's highly contagious. And so in Indonesia, it's spreading quite quickly. In Australia, it would do the same thing. Uh, it, it generally infects close to 100% of animals that come into contact with it. Lumpy skin disease, much lower. Only about 10 to 20% of animals will become infected. 
and only about 50% of them will show clinical signs. So the big issue with uh, either disease, and in particular foot and mouth disease, are the economic impacts and the effects on trade due to market disruptions. So over 70% of our agricultural products are exported, and in the case of mutton and lamb and beef and veal, it's over three quarters. And so an outbreak would uh, close our export markets and obviously impact that, uh, that, that market and cause considerable economic loss um, to Australia's agricultural industries. So with FMD, the modelling that's been done um, suggests that an outbreak could cost $80 billion. And that doesn't take into account costs such as um, yeah, damage to rural communities, mental health issues, and, and other associated costs outside of the industry. So significant uh, economic impact if it were to get into the country. So... In uh, Indonesia, FMD uh, had uh, the first case of FMD was the 12th of April. They officially notified the World Organization for Animal Health, what's called the OIE, on the 9th of May. So this is not the first time uh, FMD has been in Indonesia. They had an outbreak in 1983, which they successfully eradicated in 1986. Um, so they've dealt with it before. It's not the first time. Uh, there's about half a million animals infected. The figures might be a, a shade out of date now. Um, and over a million animals have been vaccinated to date. Um, so on the 5th of July, Australia was notified that FMD cases were in Bali. So, yeah, getting closer to our shores. Uh, in the case of um, lumpy skin disease, so Indonesia officially notified the OIE uh, of its lumpy skin disease outbreak on the 2nd of March. Um, there's been cases spread since then and the outbreak in Indonesia is ongoing. They have really been focusing on their FMD outbreak. So, you know, they're, they're haven't probably been controlling FM, uh, lumpy skin disease to the extent that they have um, FMD. So, it, you know, it is important to note that it, neither disease is in the country. Um, the pathways or potential routes of introduction um, into the country uh, are, you know, up there on the board, sort of going from left to right is the highest risk to, to, to the lower risk. So, Australia does have strict import conditions in place. So introduction of EAD through legal importation of commodities is very unlikely. The, the risk is really associated with illegal introduction of contaminated products. So with FMD, this could be uh, you know, meat or dairy products that are contaminated with virus, and then those products being fed to pigs. So pigs are infected through ingestion of contaminated products. They amplify the virus and they'll shed it and then infect other animals. So ruminants, so cattle, sheep, goats, those sorts of things are more likely to be infected through actually inhaling the virus, uh, whereas pigs through, through ingestion. So that is still the, the most likely route of entry. Um, so in Australia, and obviously many other countries as well, the feeding of um, meat and dairy products is illegal um, to pigs. So in uh, Australia, it's illegal to feed any uh, meat products uh, of mammalian origin or dairy products that have been imported. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about swill feeding later in, uh, in the talk. So the other risk um, is you know, contaminated clothing, vehicles and equipment. And so you know, obviously there's been a lot of talk about passengers returning, particularly from Bali. Um, you know, bear in mind that passengers have been coming back into Australia from many other countries that have FMD um, up until this point. So that, that, while it is a risk, it is a much lower risk than, um, yeah, than, than, than the illegal importation of meat products. Um, Yes, yeah, so, you know, it's important that if people are coming back into the country that they, you know, declare where they've been um, honestly on those um, declarations coming in 
and, and I guess at, at a producer level, farm level, you know, knowing who's coming onto your property and where they've been is, is also important. Um, yeah, so uh, there's also a risk from you know, export um, vessels, container boats returning to Australia potentially with contamination as well. Again, there's uh, processes in place to, to manage those risks. In terms of lumpy skin disease, uh, it can be spread by uh, biting insects. So that's a mechanical transmission. So biting, um, you know, things like flies, mosquitoes, ticks, when they bite an infected animal, the virus will stick to the mouth parts. They'll go off and bite the next animal and, and spread the virus that way. And, and that's the greatest challenge with lumpy skin disease. Uh, insects obviously don't respect borders. They don't tick the declaration pass on their way in. And so there's potential that they could blow into the country. They could also return on, um, you know, returning you know, uh, vessels, uh, aircraft, that sort of thing as well. Um, there's also the risk with you know, illegally imported products with uh, lumpy skin disease as well. Sorry. So in terms of what's being done, uh, so Indonesia, the Indonesian government have uh, official position at the moment to eradicate foot and mouth disease, and that's their aim. Um, by do, they're doing this by uh, vaccinating cattle and stamping out the infection in pigs. Um, so they have set up quarantine zones, movement restrictions, um, you know, cleaning and decontamination of infected sites, um, yeah, so they're also rolling out a lumpy skin disease vaccination campaign. So they're using vaccination to control lumpy skin disease. Um, that, that's, that's had some challenges over there with logistical issues. And, and they're also looking at vector control to try and minimise the spread of uh, LSD. Australia has supported Indonesia through senior government officials um, visiting Indonesia to meet with counterparts. Um, there, to gain a better understanding of the situation that's going on in Indonesia. They've also assisted through the development and delivery of education and support programs, uh, assisted with provision of vaccine, and have provided some technical and laboratory support as well. You know, obviously, it's in Australia's interests to assist Indonesia to control the disease. Uh, other near neighbours, so Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea, um, Australia been assisting those countries um, with capacity building for diagnostics, disease surveillance and preparedness over there. Obviously, um, you know, the earlier the disease, if it were to get to either of those countries, um, the, the, we want to increase the likelihood of, of it being picked up early. Um, yes, yeah, so Australia spends time working with other countries trying to you know, assist over there rather than sitting back waiting for an outbreak here. Um, on the domestic front, so we, we do have pretty good systems in Australia to uh, prevent and be prepared for emergency animal diseases. Um, What's happened recently, so there's been an EAD preparedness task force uh, established this year to coordinate department activities around LSD and FMD. Uh, there's increased engagement with industry, um, so there's various different newsletters you can get from different groups. Animal Health Australia put out a weekly bulletin updating uh, on the situation with both diseases. Uh, Australia is also investigating options for a lumpy skin disease vaccine uh, and including looking at the possibility of development uh, lo locally for, for a vaccine. Um, there's been yeah, fast tracking of existing LSD preparedness activities to build uh, enhanced diagnostic testing and surveillance. So at the border, um, we've also seen increased screening and inspections of returning uh, vessels, uh, passengers and aircraft. So in increased screening of posted packages for biosecurity risk materials. There's also been an increased use of biosecurity detector dogs at, at airports and in postage facilities. And they have put in uh, foot mats at airports to assist. So, 
yeah, that's all, um, you know, sort of big picture stuff, and it, and it's and it's interesting uh, at a producer level. And I and I guess really what we're trying to you know push out to people is you know what's important at the local level and at the farm level, and really critical is knowing the signs of both foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. If if either of them were to get into the country our ability to contain and eradicate uh, the diseases quickly really hinges on early reporting and, and diagnosing. So if we pick up the very, very first case and it hasn't spread, we have a much better chance of dealing with it than if it's spread. So you know, at, the end of the go at the end of the day, it'll be a livestock owner that sees something that just is not quite right, hopefully reports it to us, we can get it investigated and picked up early. So yeah, really it's important that as producers you know the, the signs. So foot and mouth disease, it, it can affect all cloven hooved animals. So that's, uh, you know, cattle, buffalo, sheep, goats, um, camelids, deer, so yeah, pigs, whole range of species that it can affect. So basically anything with the you know, hoof split into two. Um, the signs that we see, so initially it'll cause a blister or a vesicle, and they can occur in the mouth, on the snout in pigs, on the tongue, lips, feet, or on the teats in, in cows. Um, those uh, vesicles or blisters will then rupture and cause a raw, um, very sore lesion, open, uh, open uh, ulcer type lesion. Uh, and the signs that we see are obviously associated with the pain from those lesions. So we see limping, lameness or reluctance to move, um, particularly in pigs, that's a common sign. Uh, drooling, so a lot of salivation, uh, reluctance to eat. You see obviously production loss as associated with that and a fever as well. So you know, in dairy herds we'll see a you know, significant drop in milk uh, production and weight loss in, in beef animals. Uh, so there's some of the signs that we can see. So a couple of um, you know, cattle mouths at the top there and you can see those um, open lesions uh, in, in between the claws there on, on the hoof and then a pig snout. And I guess just yeah, reiterating the range of species that uh, foot and mouth disease can, uh, can, can infect. Um, one of the things, and, and I guess it's sort of really the, the main reason I have a job in, in, with, with LLS is to actually test for these diseases to rule them out. So these are actually some examples of animals that we've seen um, and we've tested that are not um, foot and mouth disease. So we do get animals with oral lesions that can resemble the disease and it's important that we get out and test those and make sure that it's not foot and mouth disease. So the picture on my side is a disease called bovine papular stomatitis. Um, yeah, other than the fact that it looks, well, it, it can resemble foot and mouth disease, we wouldn't get terribly excited about it. It doesn't really cause too many issues. Most commonly occurs in young cattle and that was a lesion um, on the tongue of an animal that was seen um, and again tested negative for foot and mouth disease. Uh, so with lumpy skin disease, uh, it only affects cattle and buffalo. Um, and only about 50% of animals that are infected will show cl clinical signs. There's some breed variability. So your Bos indicus breeds um, and buffalo will show less obvious signs than, than British breeds. Um, obviously, lumpy skin disease, as the name suggests, you see lumps on the skin. You can see other clinical signs as well, including uh, discharge from the nose and the eyes. Uh, enlarged lymph nodes, a drop in milk production and, and loss of body condition, uh, fever. So these animals would be you know, pretty unwell. You can see abortion and fertility issues as well. Uh, and occasionally, you know, in a small number of animals, so again, the, the mortality rates are quite low, um, but you can see internal lesions at post-mortem. Um, yeah, so there is a few more pictures of that. So yeah, obviously multiple skin lesions on these animals. Um, the, they get like a, a crust sort of in the center of that lesion. They can break off and you end up with it again, an open sort of sore. So 
again, we, we do see similar things in, in the area. So these are a couple of cases that we've seen in recent times where we've done exclusion testing. So we've tested these animals for lumpy skin disease. It's come back negative. Um, on this side, that's just an insect, insect bite reaction. So, you know, with buffalo fly over the summer months, we can certainly see uh, cattle with, with skin lesions. Um, the case on the other side is actually a, a mast cell tumour. That's uh, quite an unusual um, finding. Um, so if you see anything that resembles either of them at all, or in fact you're seeing anything that you think, gee, that's really unusual, I haven't seen that before, um, please give me a call um, and we, we can investigate it. There is a legal obligation to report, so these are notifiable diseases, and, and so you, anybody um, you know, who sees something that they think could be it has a legal obligation to let us know. And there's a few ways that you can do that. Uh, you can either ring me directly, that's my number. If you can't get hold of me, um, or if I don't get back to you reasonably quickly, then you can ring our office number, uh, 1300 795 299, and you get put in touch with one of the other district vets in our region. Uh, failing that, there is the emergency animal disease hotline number. So that is um, manned by the New South Wales DPI. They have a 24 hour service, so a vet that works with the New South Wales DPI will get back to you very quickly and they will usually contact us. Um, you can also use a private vet, so you might have a private vet that you use um, and they can do the investigation. They'll work with us and we'll work with them um, to get samples off to the lab and, and get the testing done. So yeah, I'd encourage everyone, if you haven't, put that EAD hotline number into your phone, um, you know, so you have it on standby. So other things that you can do, um, you know, that can assist in the event that we were to get an outbreak of any disease. Um, so you would have all got your annual land and stock returns from LLS recently. They need to be in by the end of the month if you haven't done it. But it does, that does give us information on where stock are, what species are on different properties and will allow us to send resources where they need to be if there were a, a, a disease outbreak. Um, being up to date with your NLIS stuff as well. So if you're running stock, you need to have a pick. Uh, you should become LPA accredited and access NVD, so use an MVD when you're selling stock. Have an online uh, NLIS database account um, and make sure that you, you are transferring animals on the database. If you're buying stock privately, then you will need to do that yourself and it's the receiver of the animals that is ultimately responsible. If you're purchasing animals through agents or sale yards, they will do that transfer on your behalf. But it is important, the NLIS, and Christy will talk about it a little bit later, is, is really an important tool if we were to get a disease outbreak, allows us to trace the movement of livestock uh, and, and work out where disease might have spread. Um, the other thing that you know, I'm suggesting people do is to perform a pick reconciliation. So on the NLIS database, it will have attached to your PIC a number of devices that it thinks are on your property, and that may, may or may not be accurate. So by doing a PIC, a PIC reconciliation, you can essentially make sure that the devices that are listed against your PIC on the database are in fact a true reflection of what's on your property at that time. And there's some handouts up the back on just how to do that. Um, prevent swill feeding, and this is really important. As I said earlier, the you know feeding of illegally imported meat products to pigs is the highest risk pathway for foot and mouth to come into the country. So what they call swill feeding, so um, prohibited pig feed is basically meat or meat products, imported milk products, or anything that's been in contact with those products. So you can't push scraps off the kitchen off, off your you know, plate that's had contact with meat, uh, it all has to go in the bin. So it's really important to make sure that pigs uh, aren't fed these sorts of products and can't access these sorts of products. 
So making sure that you're you know, fencing uh, tip areas. So we actually work with local councils to look at uh, local tips and make sure that feral pigs can't come in. Um, and obviously control feral pigs if, if you're having feral pig issues on your property. And um, Mick will talk about that a, a, in a little bit, little, uh, little time. Um, farm biosecurity plan is another very useful um, tool to help reduce the risk of any disease coming onto your property, not just uh, these e EADs. Um, so a few years ago, the LPA introduced the requirement for anyone who was accredited under that uh, program to have a biosecurity plan. Um, I expect a lot of people at that time did one. Um, some people might still be using it and might have updated it um, since, but now is a good time to look at that. Uh, in uh, 2017, uh, that, that was the case, so that was when it came in for the LPA. In 2019, there was some legislation introduced into Parliament, and that actually strengthened um, you know, the, um, the, the, the laws are around people coming onto farms without adhering to biosecurity measures in place. And so there are fines that can be issued if people come onto your property uh, illegally and, and aren't adhering to your plan. But you need to have a plan in place. You need to have signage on the gate as well. So at a, a, you know, at a, at a producer level, yeah, really it is the single most valuable step that individual producers can take. So the biosecurity plan identifies risks and risk pathways uh, for diseases, uh, pests, weeds coming onto your property. So it's more than just you know, animal diseases. Um, so it identifies those risks and pathways and, and identifies some management practices that you can undertake uh, to minimise those risks. So as I said, if you haven't reviewed your plan recently, now's a very good time. You know, do you keep record of who's come onto your property? Uh, do you ask them where they've been? I mean, obviously, you know, if people are coming onto your property that have recently returned from overseas, the current uh, federal government advice is that people returning from countries uh, where FMD is endemic uh, is to not have contact with Australian animals for at least seven day period. So ask these questions. Um, you know, do, what, what hygiene and uh, measures can you put in place? Like, you know, do you want to go down the path of foot baths? Can you ask people to leave their vehicles, you know, at the house or at the front gate, travel through your property in your vehicle? Um, you know, you could ask, you know, people to put on, you know, boots or overalls that are, that are on your property rather than wear their own boots. Simple things like that. Um, yeah, making sure that staff and family that are on the property also are aware of the plan and, and the requirements. And really, you know, it's about keeping good records. So knowing who's come on, where they've been, including your plan, a plan for emergencies. So unfortunately, the last few years, we've been hit with fires and floods. Uh, and so having a plan for those you know, fires and flood type emergencies as well is really important. Um, we are uh, happy to run some more biosecurity planning workshops. If you are interested, just see us at the end. Lou will um, yeah, grab your details or, or see myself and, and we can plan those if people are keen and yeah, step you through um, developing a plan that's suitable for your, um, for, for your farm. So if there is a suspect emergency animal disease, so you either call myself or you call a private vet or you call the EAD hotline, uh, we will come out, we will do an investigation, we'll get the history, we'll t look at the animals, we'll take sam a range of samples and we'll get those off to the, to the lab. So the testing uh, in New South Wales is done at EMAI, so it's down near Sydney. They do some testing there. There's also a federal lab in Victoria where samples can be on scent as well. So there is no cost for testing for these diseases. So the, the cost of testing at the, the labs is covered by the government. We will also do testing to try and work out what the disease actually is. Obviously, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's important that we come back to you and say, well, great news, it's not foot and mouth disease, but you'd all still like to know, you know, why your cattle are sick or why they're dying. So hopefully we can come back to you with a diagnosis and work with your management of whatever that disease would be. Uh, the big thing is if you've got unwell stock, 
please don't send them to the sale yards. Obviously having animals turn up you know, with lumps all over their skin or salivating and mouth lesions in sale yards uh, you know, creates a whole range of issues uh, as well as the fact that those sick animals are not, um, you know, not necessarily going to be fit to load anyway. So yeah, please, if you suspect anything at all, ring myself, the EAD hotline or your private vet and, and we will investigate it. So yeah, in summary for my little bit, yeah, important to know what the signs of the EADs are, particularly at the moment with foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. But anything at all that just doesn't look quite right, please get it investigated. Um, make sure that your NLIS records are up to date and, and that movements are recorded on the NLIS database. Absolutely do not feed uh, swill to pigs. And if you know of anyone with pigs who's not here, please pass that message on. That's all pigs, whether it be one pet pig or you know, a commercial producer. Um, yeah, have a farm biosecurity plan and, and use it, update it now, and, and certainly don't, don't transport any, any suspect animals. Um, so that's it for me. I'll, I'll hand over to Christy now. Good evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Christy Saul, and I work for the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries in the animal biosecurity team. Um, so I'm going to talk about what happens at a state level. Um, we'll get started here. So what is an emergency animal disease? So an emergency animal disease is a disease that is likely to have significant effects on livestock, potentially resulting in livestock deaths, production loss, and in some cases, impacts on human health and the environment. It may be a known disease, a variant of an endemic disease, or a brand new disease. An outbreak of a serious emergency animal disease can be disastrous for producers, causing significant personal stress and anguish, as well as financial hardship. The livestock industries can lose sales opportunities both domestically and internationally. In the wake of a damaged reputation for our produce and the broader Australian econ economy could lose billions in trade and employment. So what does an emergency animal disease response look like? Generally, Australian policy is to eradicate any introduced exotic animal disease as quickly as possible. So this could involve establishment of disease control zones, quarantine and movement controls. Uh, possible destruction and disposal of infected and exposed animals, decontamination of infected premises, vehicles, equipment and animal products, surveillance of susceptible animals, restriction of the activities of certain enterprises, tracing of animal movements, vaccination or wild animal control. So how does an emergency animal disease work? So when an outbreak of an emergency animal disease is confirmed, the state or territory authority will quarantine the infected property immediately. They may also quarantine other properties, such as those close to the infected property or because of a recent animal, people or vehicle movement. They also advise the Australian government, the other states and territories and the national organisations of the affected industries so that the management groups can convene and that agreed consultative disease management and funding arrangements can be put into place. The State Chief Veterinary Officer then advises the Australian Chief Veterinary Officer of the detection. They initiate quarantine, movement controls and assessments around the initial site. Um, if the outbreak is due to foot and mouth disease, a 72 hour livestock standstill will be called alerts the state emergency management agencies to activate the animal disease, diseases emergency plan and appoints a state coordinator. Uh, the chief veterinary officer also consults with national counterparts and advises to seek agreement on the preferred national control strategy. Uh, in liaison with industry and other agencies, produces an emergency animal disease response plan with approval from both the national management group and the consultative I'm going to say the CCAD, and this will activate the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement. So we'll go a bit into that agreement. Got the right slide? Yep. Um, so the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement is a unique contractual 
agreement signed in 2002 that brings together the Australian state and territory governments and livestock industry groups to collectively and significantly increase Australia's capacity to prepare for and respond to emergency animal disease incursions. The main benefit of the agreement is the ability to respond quickly and effectively to an emergency animal disease incident while minimising uncertainty over management and funding agreements. All signatories have agreed to work collectively to reduce the risk of emergency animal disease incursions and share the approved costs of an emergency animal disease response. Uh, so we'll go a bit into quarantine and movement controls. So in accordance with AusVet plan for foot and mouth disease, a national livestock standstill will be implemented in the event of a foot and mouth disease outbreak. The standstill will occur for a minimum of 72 hours. Easing, lifting or extending the standstill would be dependent on the outbreak situation. So it's really important that you as a producer um, are prepared for that. So having enough feed on, like, on hand on farm. So if, if we had a case of foot and mouth disease in Western Australia, in New South Wales, we will still go into that 72 hour standstill just to give us time to understand how far the disease is spread across Australia. Um, so then we go into a restricted area. So an initial restricted area of at least three kilometres will be drawn around all infected premises and premises of high risk and premises of high risk dangerous contact premises. Subject to intense surveillance and movement controls. So all those infected premises will have that three kilometre radius. Um, and in that three kilometre radius, there'll be no movements unless it's a really high level animal welfare situation that we may allow. Um, and then on every property with susceptible animals, they will undergo surveillance. Um, there may also be multiple restricted areas across the state. Uh, so it won't be just in one area, it just depends how far the disease is spread. Uh, so then there'll be a control area, which is um, to control the movement of susceptible livestock and livestock products for as long as necessary to complete tracing and epidemiology studies. The control area will be larger, a larger declared area around the restricted area, possibly as large as the state or territory in which the outbreak occurs. The control area will have a minimum radius of 10 kilometres the National Livestock Identification System, as most of you know as NLIS, is Australia's system for permanent identification and lifetime traceability of livestock. Successful disease control depends on fast, accurate tracing. Considerable expert resources will be dedicated to investigating movement on and off infected properties to determine where the disease might have come from and where it may have spread to. You can speed up tracing by maintaining detailed records of your stock and people movement on your property. Uh, the Australian Veterinary Emergency Plan, otherwise known as AusVet Plan, has been developed and agreed upon by governments and relevant industries in non-outbreak times to ensure that coherent, efficient and effective e emergency animal disease response can be implemented consistently across Australia with minimal delay. It is a guidance document with flexibility to address the nature of an individual emergency animal disease and the range of contacts across Australia. There are a number of disease specific documents and supporting manuals which can all be accessed on the Animal Health Australian website. So if you want to know more details about these AusVet plan documents and how we'd manage a response, you can jump onto the Animal Health Australia website and have a look. Uh, for vaccination, the role of vaccination will vary based on a range of factors where and when the disease was introduced, the strain of the virus, how long has the virus been in Australia, and its potential for spread. Australia is recognised as free from foot and mouth disease without vaccination. Preemptive use of vaccines for diseases currently not in Australia, for example, lumpy skin disease and foot and mouth disease, can have major implications for Australia's favourable disease-free status and therefore significant impacts on trade. For lumpy skin disease, um, it's primarily a mechanically transmitted vector-borne disease, so very different from foot and mouth disease, a disease 
as it is spread by insects such as biting flies, mosquitoes and ticks. In the case of a limited disease outbreak, a containment zone may be established around the areas where the outbreak is occurring with the purpose of maintaining the disease-free status of the rest of the country outside that containment zone. Okay. Uh, so New South Wales DPI and LLS are always working closely together on operational preparedness for a possible emergency animal disease incursion. With the current focus on foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, DPI's role is developing and testing New South Wales plans under OSVET plan, contributing to national policy, coordinating preparedness activities with other agency and, and jurisdictions to achieve consistency and coherence. We work with LS to provide engagement and extension materials to producers and landholders to assist them to understand and prepare for possible emergency animal disease incursions and undertake surveillance activities when needed. We encourage you to work with your local district vet to develop biosecurity plans, identify reliable information sources and build your own awareness, preparedness for emergency animal diseases. To protect your own livestock, livelihoods and that of your community in Australia. So that's all from me, thank you. And um, I'm going to hand over to Mick Elliott to talk about pest animal management. So, good evening. Yes, my name's Mick Elliott. I'm a biosecurity officer for local land services. Myself and a couple other bios uh, cover the area, area from uh, just north of Coffs down to Lorton. So we'd be the ones that you'd talk to about pest animals right across the board, whether we had a, 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 an FMD outbreak or just your day-to-day -day stuff. So I'm just going to give you a few notes on pest animals, um, what we can do, how we can go about it, and encourage you to um, work together. We've already heard that that's a critical thing in any of these outbreaks, in any problems, especially with, with pest animals. If we can work together, if a, a group of landholders get together, you're going to have way more success. So um, as we've heard, feral animals, including feral pigs, uh, can be susceptible to, to FMD. Um, and right now is the time for livestock uh, producers, landholders, to get that plan in place. What are we going to do about pest animals? Because, as I've said, if you're talking to your neighbours and everyone's aware of what's going on, your ability to, re to, um, to control pest animals and keep it at a, as a minimal, at a minimum is going to be helpful as you move forward through any sort of outbreak. Um, the good seasonal conditions that we've seen um, say good seasonal conditions haven't been terrific, but the amount of moisture that's been about, pigs have loved it. So something like pigs have moved into areas that they've never been before. So we have, we have a lot of people out there with confusion about, I've never had pigs, I don't know how to go about it. So that's when you come and talk to us. And, and even if you haven't got pigs and you think you might get them, or you know that they're up the road, come and have a chat. We can work out a way to, so that you can, can um, prepare yourself for any, anything that comes onto your plates. Um, interestingly enough, with a with a um, pig, uh, a feral pig outbreak, you need to control somewhere around 80% of those pigs to get that population going down, and that's extremely difficult. So the sooner you get onto them, the the easier it is, the quicker success rate you're going to get, and the better success rate you're going to get. Um, and one of the things that that um, with any pest animal is that not one thing will work. You'll hear a lot of people talk about. I don't worry so much about the pigs because I don't mind shooting them. I don't mind, I've got a, my cousin comes up and use, chases dogs, uh, uses the use dog to chase them and, and he keeps them under control. The problem is with any pest animal, if you rely on one control method, you will fail. You have to use all, as many control methods as you can to keep that population under control. Because the facts are that um, any sort of pest animal other than on small islands are extremely difficult to eradicate. We can keep the population down, which is what we aim for all the time. So um, <clears throat> what do we do? Well, it's interesting, you know, you say that we actively monitor uh, the breeding activity, the sightings, uh, environmental impacts. And some people say, well, what are you doing monitoring? But that's critical to know where we would throw resources if 
if there was an outbreak of, for example, foot and mouth disease. So if, if, you, if we don't know that there's pigs on your place or we don't know that there's a pest animal on your place that might carry foot and mouth, we're not going to be prepared in your area. So that's why it's critical for you to tell us what's on your place. Um, we res respond to requests for assistance for, for, to alleviate impacts um, and we get to work out times of year where impacts are greatest. Wild dogs, we've got them down pretty well on the, on the money now as far as when the best time to do control. And that comes from you people telling us about what's happening on your place and the success you've had or the failures you've had. That's how we learn about this stuff. So it says specialist advice on control techniques. Yep, we can do that. We can give you the options because some of them aren't going to work on your place and some will. Um, we supply training. That training is free. For a lot of those cards, we have an online course now to get your uh, chemical card. Um, that can be done at your own leisure online or we do, we do have face-to-face um, -face meetings again now and we supply poison baits which are free. So there's not a lot of excuses out there not to get involved in something that, that we're doing or we want to do for you. We definitely coordinate those programs as I said before about getting um, uh, landholders together. We aim to get public land, other public land managers involved um, so that we get a cross-tenure approach to pest animals because pest animals don't care about fences, they don't care about borders. Importantly, there's a, a rel relatively new way of, of uh, reporting pest animals now and that's on a feral scan uh, app. Um, you can download that app free on your phone and it allows you to put uh, information in about what you've seen, when you've seen it. You can actually take a photo and put that on there. Uh, certainly uh, deer in our area are exploding and a lot of the information that we're getting now about where we might put those resources in a problem time is based on that information. So that's a free app, it's really easy to use and um, importantly all your data is kept private. So no one else can see. If you have put pigs on your place, no one else can see it. We can see it of course and we may well be in touch with you to say how do you want to go about this? How do you, how do you need help for this? Um, and mo most importantly it's going to help protect our community because any of these pest animals without any FMD, without any lumpy skin, needs protection from pest animals because they are, are out there 24-7 breeding away. So any of those animals that are in bigger populations, they become explosive very quickly. Smaller populations, we can control. Bigger ones, very difficult. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the end of the formal presentation.